Hi there, welcome to the breadboard. In this video, we're going to start looking at home automation. In the past, I've done a number of different videos using industrial controllers and a number of ESP8266 and Arduino based sensing devices. And one of the themes that I always fall back on is that I do not like to use cloud based services, particularly. I mean, they have their place, don't get me wrong. But the one thing that drives me nuts, and also my wife especially, is if we lose our internet for a little while, she can't turn on the lights in her sewing room uh, easily. You have to resort to a few little workarounds to get them on because her Google Home or the uh, Alexa system just relies on internet and cloud-based services to interpret the voice and then bring the commands back down so they can talk to, say, a Wemo switch or something like that. So what I want to do in this series of videos that are going to be coming up in the future is to start looking at a number of devices that can be used to put together home automation, but that can also be reprogrammed to not rely on cloud-based services. Now, everything you see in front of you right here um, this socket, the three-way sun-off switch, this little plug-in socket. This one's a replacement socket for a standard North American um, outlet. Um, this replaces a switch. It's a three-way one, and it's touch. Um, this one is just a plug-in replacement socket, same as this one here. They're just two different makes. And this one here is actually a switch dimmer that can replace a standard um, paddle type switch or even just a little toggle switch in North America as well. And then this is Edison screw light bulb that is also a smart light bulb. This is RGBWW. Um, now the one thing that all of these have is that they don't have switches on them and short of breaking them open they're a little bit difficult to reprogram. But we can reprogram all of these to not rely on cloud-based services uh, either running on your cell phone or running on something else. I like to use Node Red and Home Assistant to run things that I have here locally in my house. And I'm going to show you how to do all of this. Um, the other part is that you can still use um, Alexa or Google Home to do things, but you're not 100% reliant on it. You can still um, go to the switch and touch a button or you can go to a control panel which I'm, we're going to build based on a Raspberry Pi and one of the touch screens that I have um, or you can pick up your phone if you've got local Wi-Fi in your home and still control those devices as well. It doesn't have to go all the way out to the internet and all the way back in again to do anything which is exactly what I want to achieve here and which I know a lot of people that are watching this would want as well. So without getting into a whole bunch of details about each of these individual units right now. We will slowly go through them all. The first one I want to have a look at is this one right here because I have an immediate need to actually integrate that into part of my home automation sooner than later. All these other ones, I already have various ones of them in my home automation. So I'm going to move these out of the way just for the moment and we're going to have a look at this switch. Now this switch came from Banggood. You can get it from a number of different places, but this one came from Banggood. They kindly sent it to me. Most of the pieces I just showed you, I've actually bought with my own money um, to do the home automation and to show you how to use them. This one was kindly sent by Banggood, and I'll provide the link so that you can get your own if you want them uh, at, in the description as well. So inside here, we'll find that we have um, a little bit of packaging information the switch itself, some additional screws, so let's just get rid of the packaging. Let's see what's in here. So we have a sewn off little QA card, don't care about that. We have wiring guide for the Sonoff to show us how exactly to wire this together. As I said, it is a three-way switch in this case, so we will be following um, along closely, and I'll make you aware of a few things that you've got to be careful of. 
uh, which does bring me to an important point. In this video, we're going to be dealing with mains. All right. If you're younger, you've never played with mains, or you're not sure what you're doing, get somebody to help you that does know what they're doing, because I don't want to be. I'm not responsible for you electrocuting yourself, or getting a shock, or hurting yourself, or blowing the fuses in your house. I know what I'm doing, and if you don't, make sure you get somebody that does. So this is the Sonoff. We got a um, English, Spanish, Italian, Dutch, French, and looks like Russian. A uh, little instruction manual as well uh, that talks about how to set this up. Now, out of the box, these will be wanting to connect to Sonoff's uh, We, I think it's We Link or something like that. Services. I'll put a pop up up to say what service it is. So it is like all the other products I had initially configured to run on a cloud based service. Now you can still just touch the buttons on the front that will illuminate when we power this thing up uh, to be able to control things directly which is nice but if you want to use um, your phone or something like that to control this you will need to have the um, cloud-based services set up initially. One of the things we're going to do though is we're going to reprogram this so you don't have to do that. All right. So first thing, let's have a look at what we've got here. Let's just take the wrap uh, off. So it's a very sleek, smooth panel. Nothing to worry to write home about there. On the back, we've got our connectors. They're all protected by a little shield here. We'll take that off. So we've got screw connections here. We've got a uh, neutral connection at one end. We have a live in. Uh, sorry, where's live in? Yeah, here's live in here. So we've got neutral, live, and then we've got output one, two, and three. All right, now the three outputs would go to your load, and then they would come back to neutral. And then that would be it. Right, so functionality-wise, we've got the live and neutral, which needs to be provided to this unit in order to even make it work in the first place. That will bring up the front panel illumination so you can see what's there. And then what you would do is you would run your three um, outputs to your various loads. In my case, they're going to end up going to um, some lights and a sewing machine. Um, which is this is more than capable of handling. Now, I'll put a diagram up on the screen so you can see how you would wire them up. Um, actually, I think it's even in here already, so let me just grab that. Yeah, so you can see here that you would have your live and neutral coming in, and then you have live switched out to your loads, and then the other side of your load would go back to neutral. Now if you're bringing it back to the same panel, um, you would use screw it or something like that to be able to connect all these together. Um, now be aware that having too many wires in one panel may violate the local code regulations for your area, so check on that. You may have to have a uh, separate box for a lot of this. So the first thing we're going to do just for this video, because we're reviewing this, I'll have the uh, integrating it into the sewing room lighting system in a separate video, is we're going to power this up and see what the controls are and then see how we're going to be able to reprogram this, if, if at all. All right. So let's uh, get it hooked up and let's see if we, what it looks like when it's powered up with the main. Okay, everything is wired up. I've provided a live and neutral. This just happens to be a different colored wire for North America. Uh, the neutral would normally be the white wire in North America and the live would be the black wire. Um, I'm actually also using something else that's not normally available in North America and that is a quick test box. Um, if you ever watch bigclive.com or something you'll have seen him use these a lot as well. Um, it's a very convenient and quick way of connecting up wires and for testing in labs and things. Um, what you have is a couple of spring clips, um, well, lot for live, neutral, and earth, and you just put your wires underneath, and the spring pressure holds them on. Now, there's absolutely no connection here right now. There are blades here that, um, on the back of this, 
they will drop into the blades when I close the lid and make the circuit. So you get no power on these until this lid is closed. You have a neon indicator here that shows us that the thing is alive and kicking. Now, I have my bench also hooked up with a um, RCD, a residual current disruptor, or GFCI, depending on what you want to call it, ground fault circuit interrupter, um, basically device that will trip if I accidentally provide a path through me to ground instead of the normal way through this. Um, that shouldn't happen, but it's there for safety just in case. Anyway, so let's power this up. This is the first time I'm powering it up, so I'm not going to be holding it while I do it. And it should power up. I can actually see very faint lights in here. Yeah. All right, now it's off a bit. You can see we have the three switch connect places here. And we have a light flashing down the bottom here to indicate that we need to uh, pair this device up. And I don't really want to register this device on the E-Wink environment either. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at how we upgrade this to the latest version of Tasmoda and get it up and running. So before we do that though, I want to have a quick look inside and show you what this thing is built with. So let me just disconnect it from the mains and we'll show you. Uh, in the meantime, it is already working even though it's not configured. I can already, and if you listen, you can hear it. I bring it up close to my chest here. Right, you can hear the relays clicking in and out. All right, anyway, let's power this off, get it open, see what's inside. Okay, first part of getting this apart is to get the front off of it. So what we have here is a bezel that, sorry, getting under the camera here, is a bezel that is just clipped on the front. So we should be able to just, I can find a screwdriver or something, clip it off. Let me find a better screwdriver than my nail. Okay, I have loosened all the screws and everything and unclipped the top. So if we take this apart now, we can see this is the top cover. It's got a blanking out plate so you can't see right through the semi-opaque front panel and little white areas for the lights to show through. We have three independent touch sensors. I think these are touch modules in their own right, the capacitive sensors. The one version of this with just a single channel has just the center one installed. I think there's still space for the other two. Uh, we have the ESP8266 up in this top left corner here, driving here. This looks like a voltage regulator. And we have a antenna for the ESP8266. And we have an antenna here for what I presume would be a 433 megahertz uh, remote control as well. That depends it being much, much bigger because of the lower wavelength or longer wavelength, but lower frequency. Have a little reset button on the side. So this just unplugs from the bottom module. Okay, there's a little header on the bottom here. This would be a driver probably for the touch pads because it is directly connected to those um, through the traces here to this. And then this is going to go through and talk to the ESP8266 up here. So that's pretty much all there is on here. A lot of screening around this touch panel area, probably so you don't get any interference. There's also the ESP8266 programming um, header location. It looks like there's another chip here, probably for the touch pads to uh, communicate with them, like a subprocess. So you've got a little microcontroller for that. You've got the ESP8266 for the Wi-Fi control, and everything goes down for driving relays, etc., and the power coming up to this board through this little plug-in header, which plugs in right here. Okay, 
So if I bring that up, you can see plugs in right there. Now this is the relay board. It was held in by four screws, which I've now removed so that I can lift this out. So there's nothing left inside here. And you've got a lot of all the main side is down here. This is your neutral and live in. So neutral and live. Live goes to feed all three relays, which then come out here. Lots of clearance. You can see um, clearly marked delineation here as well. We have a rectifier and a buck converter. So this is rectifying the mains. Um, we're going to have some capacitors here, transformer, um, standard, you know, very, very similar for what a lot of these um, ESP8266 Sonoffs and things have. It's just laid out slightly differently. So this is fully isolating. You can see in this case, instead of using pins on the bottom of the transformer, they've got the windings coming out on wires to the um, safe, let's call it safe side of everything. So this top board actually doesn't have any mains direct connected to mains. It's all isolated through the isolated buck converter here. So you've got mains on this side, um, then it's pulsed through the way that the buck converter works through, and then it comes out here. You're going to have a diode here for uh, rectifying the energy coming through the transformer, and then this is all voltage regulation, etc., for the ESP8266 up on this board. So there's your 3.3 volt regulator for the circuitry up here. Um, down here, we've also got three transistor drivers. Um, bring that up just a little bit. One, two, three for driving these three separate relays, one for each channel. And then you've got your screw terminals for bringing out your lives or bringing, yeah, going out lives um, back to your board. Now you could technically wire this the opposite way around. You could put neutral on here, live here, feed lives out to your loads and then bring the lives back through the load and you'd be connecting it to neutral. It would still work that way. The difference there though is that you would always have live going up to your uh, bulbs or whatever you put as a load for this. Whereas if you bring the live in here and come through here, as long as this is off, there would be no mains up on the bulb. So you, it would be a little bit safer if you ever had to work on it. Now, obviously, you still should disconnect everything if you're going to be you know, uh, messing with the light sockets or whatever you've got connected to this. But it's still nice to have it slightly safer. And your neutral is way out of the way. Now, you can't bring all your wires, your three lives going out to your loads. Uh, you can't bring the neutrals all back to here because as you can see, um, there's very, very thin traces here. This is only here to provide the power for the internal module. So your grouping of your neutral should be done external to this light switch, not within it. Um, and that's pretty much all there is in here. So it's it looks pretty well built. These relays are five volt relays and they're rated at yeah each relay is rated at 10 amps so for a normal lighting load this would not be an issue and for light loads like in my case one of these is going to be turning on and off a sewing machine but the sewing machine just has a small motor on it when it's running um, but you wouldn't be switching the motor load on and off with this you'd just be switching the power supply for the sewing machine on and off with it and then the motor would be run manually when the user starts sewing or in this case long arming so quilting um, yeah so that's everything that's inside here nothing much to write home about uh, what we will do though now while we have this out is I will um, flash this so through here um, to program the Tasmoda software onto it um, that's going to be, I'll do that offline. I've shown plenty of times how to flash Tasmoda onto um, ESP8266 based boards, including Sonoffs, in other videos. And I'll provide a link to one of those um, in the description so that you can go watch that video to see how you would program an ESP8266. All right. So, yeah, let me put this back together and we'll continue. 
Okay, I've now flashed this with the latest Tasmoda 7.1 point something. And it's done actually by just connecting to this programming port right here. It's a simple 3.3 volt uh, TTL kind of programming. Very standard. I have lots of videos showing how to do that on the internet. I'm going to Tasmoda's own website. It literally has a tutorial for this specific module. So I just had a quick check on there. The only trick with this is you need to ground GPIO0 and the reset button here is not GPIO0, it's just a reset. And GPIO0 is not near here for easy connection, it's actually right on the top of that resistor right there. So this left hand side from the view we have is where you would ground it as you power up the device and it puts the ESP8266 here into programming mode. Then you just simply upload the firmware, uh, reboot, and then it puts itself into um, AP mode, which allows you to connect with a browser to the device, and then you can set up um, parameters, um, sorry, and then you program its MQTT parameters, uh, any Wi-Fi parameters you need for your local Wi-Fi, and if you want to put a password in and you can also set up a template there are templates already available again on the Tasmoda website that you just drop in the template string into the web page uh, that once you've configured it and it tells it that it's got three buttons and how it all works and everything else it's pretty standard D do remember to activate it though just picking it is not enough you need to activate the template and then all of them will work if you don't activate it then only one channel will work. Anyway, I've done that. Um, leave in the comments if you actually want to see a video of how to do that. Um, and I'll make a separate video for that. So now we just need to plug this back together. Now the one nice thing is you do not need to zoom back out again a little bit. Uh, you do not need to have this plugged into the mains module here. Um, so I wouldn't recommend definitely having this wired up to mains and having this plugged in and trying to program it. That's really, really bad and you're going to electrocute yourself. Um, unplug it from the module. No soldering to do that. I just put the four pin programming header into there with some pins and just held some gentle pressure on it so that it would um, make the connections properly while I programmed it. And just as I powered it up, I just held... Um, a grounding point to the edge of this resistor over here that I showed you before. Uh, once it's in that mode you can let go of that ground position and just keep that there and then just tell it to upload the new firmware and then you're done. Now once you've done that the first time you can actually upload over the air now to this anytime you want. Um, the other devices that we were going to look at in a future video, things like this light bulb, um, sorry, get it in view here, um, is done in a different way. You use a, a, a special utility that uh, um, one of the guys on YouTube um, put together and we'll do that in a separate video to show you how you do these things. There are videos already out there but I'm going to be doing these anyway so I might as well record it and show you how I do it. Um, that's for bulbs, for sockets, etc, etc. Um, especially devices that are not um, easy to get to programming pins and things like that. They're not designed to be pulled apart. So this other method of programming means you don't have to do that at all. Anyway, let's get this thing reassembled so that we can see that it still works. So I'll pop this in here. Just pushes down back into the socket like that. And we take the lid, make sure we have it the right way around. So there's a little slot on the end of the lid here for uh, levering it off when you want to, because it's going to be flush against the wall. So we just put that back on. Actually, I'm going to run it with it off just for a moment. The one thing I'm finding is that there's not a lot of light gets through um, to the top. So it's difficult to see for some reason. Um, if I hook this back up to my power outlet, You'll see what I mean about how bright this is with the uh, without the cover on. Um, I'm doing this so that you don't have to, as the saying goes, because it's 
you know, exposed mains and stuff like that. So you really should be careful what you're doing. I do know what I'm doing. I'm trained and I am an electronics engineer, electrical engineer. I've been doing this for years and years and years. So doesn't mean I haven't had my fair share of shocks over the years. I have. Now, this is isolated due to that transformer uh, and the way that this works, but I'm not going to be touching anything metal just in case. You know, there's no point in tempting fate. So if you power this up now, all right, you've got, you can barely see them because we've got a lot of bright light shining on here. Um, Two of these are on a little bit brighter and one of them's down. Let me just turn off the... No, oh, actually the camera is picking it up a little nicer. There you go. So that's off. It's still got a little bit of a glow to it. And then that's on. You can see it illuminates a lot more. These are the touch panels. All right, on, off. I know that's flickering but I think it's interacting with some of the other lights and reflecting off of it. Um, to the naked eye, I cannot see that flickering at all. Um, you can see the LEDs on the edge. They will change intensity, right? That's bright and lower. Bright and lower. So when you put the cover on this, just turn it off while I'm messing with this. Don't want to accidentally put my fingers on the side there. And I think I just need to make sure that's in. You obviously want this to hold on tight when it's in. There we go. All right, now if I power this up, make sure my fingers are not touching anything. All right, you can just about see the little Wi-Fi light there. So that's, that's pretty darn faint. I'm not sure if there's anything I can do about that. Um, I'll have to provide some feedback. They do work fine. But the nice thing now is, all right, so the top and bottom ones are on. Now this is also now connected to my Wi-Fi. So if I can remember the uh, address of it. All right, so just gone to its IP address. And now you can see here that my phone is working happily. Now I had not gone onto the internet. This is working on my local internet. Um, I've still got the light down low. That's why you're getting a bit of a effect with the green chroma keying and things around me. Sorry about that. But now I can just toggle these on and off. And you can see just from the phone here, it is happily turning on and off. And you can go into different things, like you can go in and configure this. All right. So Tasmoda gives you all these things. You can configure the module, which is where you tell it um, what kind of module it is. And I've told it it's a Sonoff 3 channel. It's actually pre-programmed in here. Um, you configure the Wi-Fi, right? Um, MQTT because this talk, this uses MQTT um, as a reposit central repository for all of the different devices and then I use Node Red and um, Haspian to connect to Node Red and do all of the automation tasks that I want. So here's where you configure that. Um, you've got timers you can set up, you've got logging. Um, when you want to configure a template you just go into configure template and then you can say, based on whatever you like, give it its own name, and then it sets up all these. But once you've done that, you have to come back out, go back into Configure Other, and then the template will show up here, and you have to click Activate right there, and then say Save. Now, the next thing that you can also do is configure it with a Hue, emulate a Hue bridge. So this will probably emulate three devices. So if I save that, it's going to reboot the device. I have an Amazon uh, Alexa close by. So if I go into that and tell it to discover, 
it should find these. Now it should be, um, I'm not sure what it's going to call them, but let's just go and bring that up and we'll see. Alexa, discover devices. Right, so this should now discover them. Um, if I bring up my Alexa on my phone, uh, we should see them come up in here. All right, so we've got all, if I say all devices. So this is a dual switch. These are the things I've had set up before. And what we should see is something a little different come up once it's finished. Yeah. All right, so it's now got Tasmoda, Tasmoda 2, and Tasmoda 3. These have just appeared. And if I tell Alexa now, I should be able to get it to turn these on and off. Alexa, turn on Tasmota 3. Alexa, turn on the Tasmota. Alexa, turn off Tasmota. Okay. So I need to call it something slightly different because obviously my accent is uh, messing up Alexa slightly. Okay, that's a problem with <laughs> the Alexa device, not... Uh, me because if I go into Tasmoda here, it's the voice recognition, right? I'm happily turning on and off that even with the Alexa app now. So you can see you can still use your remote apps, but now you can use Alexa uh, directly without having to have any bridging software or anything like that. And all I did was tell it to go into um, the hue emulation mode and then I can pick up number two and do the middle one so that's number two on um, right there, there we go so there's the first one turn it on And there's the third one. Turn it on. So that's all working quite nicely there. Um, as I said, the only downside I'm seeing right now is that these don't have much of a indicator on them, which kind of sucks. But um, as I said, I'll look into that and see if there's anything we can do. In the meantime, um, I don't have a whole bunch of loads here to show you with this. What I wanted to do in this video was show you um, the device talk about it nope just use it it does use it as I said by default it uses its e-wink software I've never really liked to have my uh, cloud services being in control of my local devices and the e-wink services are probably in China somewhere um, as well and um, no matter where they are I really don't like it whether it's you know whether it's Amazon's cloud services or something else what I showed you just there is that you can still use your smartphone your um, Amazon Echo um, dot whatever and you can still use the buttons right on the front and you can even use the web interface that comes with this to control it. Now I'm going to be doing separate videos when I hook it into the sewing room lighting system to show you how to do that and I will configure Node Red to even look at a motion sensor and if it doesn't detect motion for a while it'll automatically turn off at least the lights and things like that um, just to save on electricity and things. So back to the ratings, yeah this is rated at 240 volts at 2 amps, 4 amps and 8 amps is what it's saying here. I guess they're different devices. Oh the 3 channel one is 8 amps. So basically they're just saying you know limit it to like 2 or 3 amps per channel. Now the relays physically are capable of more and more than that, but obviously it's all running on the one live wire going in. So you're really restricted to what that live wire has capacity to drive. None of the loads I'm doing are anything more than one or two amps each anyway. The lights are certainly way under um, an amp because they're just LED panels and 
the long arm is probably only going to take maybe a couple of amps and it's all electronic so you're not going to get those big heavy duty oomphs that would mess something up when it's running and uh, yeah that's pretty much it anyway that is the Sonoff T1 US now you can get this in a UK version um, you can get it in a European version so the the shape changes the sort of UK one is more square um, I'm sure that the basic electronic schematics and everything are exactly the same the programming depending on the model the layout of where the pins are might be slightly different but that's fine it's easy enough to find out what that info is you do need to get into it to reprogram it uh, in this case but it's very very easy and if you've got an Arduino and things like that and you've been programming those it's no different I use um, visual code now with platform IO but you can still use the Arduino IDE as well to do this not an issue once you've got Tasmoda loaded and as I said we're up to version 7 now then you can easily do over-the-air uh, programming from that point on you don't need to take it back off the wall and mess around with it or anything like that so um, yeah these are only about fifteen dollars too and that's a three channel one um, and you can get them from Banggood I'll provide the link there are other places you can buy them as well um, if you buy them through my link to Banggood I will get a small commission as an affiliate to help run the channel won't cost you any more money but you will help me a little bit uh, anyway so this is the device very very nice robust well well built um, I've been using Sonoff devices for quite a number of years and they have worked very 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 well um, this one the as I said the only thing I'm a bit disappointed on is the lack of intensity of these um, indicators here I've turned the light off so it's a little bit dimmer if I turn it back on again you see you it's completely washed it out and the camera is just about detecting it now I've got a lot of light beaming down on this I guess in most circumstances you would be able to um, see some but you it really isn't doing a terribly good job getting through that um, plastic so anyway uh, that's the video for today and if you like it give me a thumbs up if you don't well then don't but um, I'm sure that if you want to play with these yourself you may have some questions and feel free to ask them in the comments and I'll be uh, doing my best to give you the answers you need. See you on the next video. Bye.